Good evening. I'm Marcy Kahn, Chair of the New York City Bar's Task Force on the Rule of Law, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our program this evening on Lawyer Silence and the Rise of Authoritarianism. Our task force has, during the past three years, issued calls to our fellow members of the Bar to rise up as the guardians of the rule of law, which is the foundation for our democratic institutions. In the fall of 2020, we presented a comprehensive five session forum on preserving the rule of law in an age of disruption for lawyers and the public, surveying developments which have threatened the impartial administration of justice in this country, identifying specific actions the profession could take to repair the damage done. After the 2020 presidential election, in our call to American lawyers to support the rule of law, we urged all lawyers to educate the public on how the filing of frivolous, evidence-free lawsuits challenging the results of the election amounted to a wholesale attack on our democracy and called on our colleagues to act responsibly in their advice to clients, in their public statements, and in their service to the community in order to protect the democratic institutions for future generations. And last month, we partnered with the American Bar Association in issuing a call to all members of the bar to protect our freedoms by joining our election protection program for this year's midterm elections. Links to our work on those initiatives and to our entire body of work can be found in the chat for your reference. Our program this evening brings together stellar speakers from three continents, all internationally celebrated experts, who will offer their firsthand views of where lawyers have stood tall and where they have fallen short in fighting autocracy in other countries, and will explain how the struggle to preserve democratic freedoms has been transformed in the modern era. They will explain the central roles lawyers and law firms play in the rise or demise of authoritarianism at home and abroad. The relevance of this topic to us in the US today could not be more obvious. Can anyone doubt that the threat of autocracy continues to rise in this country? Adding to his long list of actions over the past six years which have undermined the rule of law, just this weekend, the former president of the United States, after declaring his intention to seek that office again in 2024, explicitly endorsed the termination of our Constitution. How important to the protection of our democracy are the actions of lawyers at this moment in our nation's history? That the answer to this question is obvious is demonstrated by our being joined by 14 other committees and task forces of the New York City Bar Association in bringing these extraordinary speakers to you for tonight's program. There are too many co-sponsoring organizations to name, but the list is on our website. I offer the thanks of the Rule of Law Task Force to the leaders of those co-sponsoring groups for their support. I also wish to thank our program chair, Jeffrey Gracer, and his subcommittee members, Stephen Cass and Scott Horton, for putting this important program together. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the president of the New York City Bar Association, Susan Coleman, for some introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Marcy. Uh, and thank you to uh, all of our panelists. And thank you to those of you who are listening in. The New York City Bar Association has long played a critical role in protecting the professional independence of lawyers, which is a bulwark of our democracy. It was one of our founding principles at the very beginning of the City Bar. During the civil rights era, the City Bar helped organize efforts by New York City's lawyers to defend civil rights workers. Shortly after the Selma March, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King spoke in the Great Hall of the City Bar, I'm virtually there, that's what you're looking at, and praised the efforts of America's lawyers saying, quote, the road to freedom is now a highway because lawyers throughout the land yesterday and today have helped clear the obstructions 
and helped eliminate roadblocks by their selfless, courageous espousal of difficult and unpopular causes. 50 years ago, during the 1970s, city bar delegations to Argentina, Chile, and other countries brought some measure of visibility and protection for lawyers and human rights advocates who were courageously combating forced disappearance, torture, and murder. City bar members later played a critical role in helping to hold human rights violators accountable after the return of democracy. And most recently, in an exhibit entitled Lawyers Without Rights, we examined the silence of the organized bar in Germany as Jewish lawyers and judges were expelled from the profession and killed during the Nazi era. What role should the city bar and its members play in protecting the rule of law today? Where, as you heard Marcy say, uh, efforts to undermine democracy are increasingly taking place within legal systems and as well as outside of our legal systems. Does silence from the legal profession make us complicit? When, if ever, is a lawyer obligated to defend democracy? We have seen lawyers at the center of efforts to undermine the rule of law and faith in electoral systems. Is there a line beyond which no lawyer should go? These are some of the questions we will examine today by looking at past experience in Germany, in Argentina, in Chile, in Hungary, and elsewhere. We greatly appreciate the amazing efforts uh, of the Rule of Law Task Force chaired by Marcy Kahn, proud of all the work they have done that she described, to shine a light on these issues and help us grapple with how we can best engage and respond in the finest tradition of Martin Luther King, hopefully helping to clear the highway of obstruction and roadblocks and making noise and not standing silent. And with that, Marcy, I'm gonna turn it back to you to kick off the program. Thank you very much, Susan. Susan's poignant questions will be our focus for the next 90 minutes. Here is the format for this evening's presentation. All members of the audience will be muted during the program. Our moderator, Professor Orent Licker, will introduce our speakers and after their presentations, they will be glad to take questions from the audience and may well ask questions of one another. The only exception will be European Parliament Vice President Katerina Barley, whose remarks were pre-recorded due to a schedule conflict, but who did take questions from the moderator during the recording. The Zoom chat function is disabled, but you can type your questions into the Q&A function by clicking the tab at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many of them as time permits. We are thrilled to have as our moderator for this evening, Diane Orentlecker, a professor of international law at American University's Washington College of Law and co-faculty director of its Center on Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. In the mid-1990s, she founded the law school's War Crimes Research Office, which provides legal analysis in support of international and transitional justice initiatives. She is one of the world's leading authorities on human rights law and war crimes tribunals, and has served in various positions at the U.S. State Department and at the United Nations. Professor Orenlicker helped develop the legal framework for the field of transitional justice. Her book, Some Kind of Justice, the ICTY's Impact in Bosnia and Serbia, has been described as a definitive account of the impact in Bosnia and Serbia of cases brought before the International Crime Criminal Tribunal for the former, former Yugoslavia. She also served as a member of the City Bar's mission to Chile during the Pinochet years, investigating the administration of justice there, including the impact on judges and lawyers in the handling of human rights cases, as mentioned by President Coleman. And she will be introducing our speakers. Professor Oren Lecker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and to the Association of the Bar of the City of New York for organizing this timely program. It's a real honor to participate in this event. Decades ago, uh, as Marcy mentioned, when I was a full-time human rights lawyer, 
based in New York, I had the opportunity to see up close how effectively the City Bar Association provided moral leadership in addressing threats to the rule of law, always based on trenchant analysis and always reflecting the highest standards of legal professionalism. And of course, as we've heard, um, it has continued to play that role. Turning to this evening's program, a hallmark of countries whose leaders commit grievous violations of human rights is an evisceration by the government of legal protections through legal techniques, such as using constitutional provisions to eliminate guardrails against human rights violations and also persecuting independent lawyers and judges. In these circumstances, Many lawyers have been understandably scared into silent submission, but all too often, brutal regimes have been fortified by the willing complicity of many lawyers and judges. Two of our panelists, Juan Mendez and Katerina Barley, will reflect on extreme examples of these phenomena in Germany and Latin America, as well as historical lessons for contemporary challenges. Today's threats to the rule of law, as we've heard, can be harder to detect than those posed and then ruthlessly realized by Adolf Hitler and the Argentina junta. Yet if unchecked, these threats can produce very serious outcomes. For some years now, we've seen the emergence of leaders that some have called the new autocrats, such as Hungary's Viktor Orban. Notably as well, we've seen these leaders rising influence with political actors in other countries, including those where democracy has deep roots. Again, this has already been mentioned, including the United States. As Professor Kim Shepley has chronicled, a signature strategy of the new autocrats is their subversive use of legal forms to eviscerate the rule of law and degrade democracy itself. In this setting, the enabling roles and professional responsibilities of lawyers merit special scrutiny. Indeed, it's urgently important for the organized bar to ask and try to answer the hard questions that Susan Coleman posed in her opening remarks. As we take up these uh, questions, and as Marcy Khan has indicated, we're really lucky to be joined by an extraordinary panel of experts. I wanna turn first to Juan Mendez a renowned leader in the field of human rights, who I am very proud to claim as my colleague on the faculty of the Washington College of Law at American University. When his native country, Argentina, suffered horrific human rights violations during military rule in the 1970s, Juan Mendez courageously defended political prisoners before he became one himself. Not long after the military went to exiled Ms. Professor Mendez in 1977, he became a globally renowned international human rights advocate. His contributions in this area are too numerous to mention, but let me just note a few. Professor Mendez has served as General Counsel to Human Rights Watch, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, President of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and President of the International Center for Transitional Justice. He now serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture, a member of the UN International Independent Expert Mechanism on Racial Justice and Law Enforcement, and as an advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Professor Mendes has also been a prolific and influential scholar. Juan, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Diane, for those kind words. Um, it's a long time. Yes, uh, that's why there's so many things to, to mention. Um, I also want to uh, share uh, uh, in what you said, uh, Diane, about uh, our gratitude to uh, the, the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. And it's more than gratitude for the invitation to speak, but also for all that you have done, especially uh, with regards to the Southern Cone of, of Latin America, uh, but also elsewhere. 
and it's all it's gratitude and it's also admiration for the the role that the New York Bar Association has played uh, so effectively. Um, in Argentina, between the early 1970s and 1983, when first uh, repression uh, under you know newly elected governments, not necessarily democratic, uh, and then uh, after 1976 under a military regime, um, uh, was the, the the time of our tragedy of what uh, some people euphemistically call the dirty war. Uh, we. But I want to start by saying that lawyers were not silent. Uh, lawyers uh, participated uh, sometimes very under very uh, dire circumstances, very difficult circumstances, very dangerous circumstances in defending political prisoners, but also in denouncing torture and uh, arbitrary arrest and, uh, and the use of um, procedures that violated due process like special courts or special criminal tribunals against subversion, quote unquote, uh, later replaced by military courts to try civilians. But uh, by that time, uh, lawyers were very, very short supplied to appear before those, uh, those uh, military courts. Uh, I, I want to remember that the very first recorded disappearance in Argentina of the literally tens of thousands of disappeared uh, persons whose fate and whereabouts we still don't know, was a lawyer, Nestor Martins, uh, a lawyer, a labor lawyer, but who also uh, uh, had at the time uh, managed to book uh, six or seven uh, federal police officers for torturing one of his clients. So uh, the lawyers were at the forefront of this. Uh, the wave of re re repression singled out lawyers. Uh, it, memorably, uh, President Jorge Rafael Videla, um, uh, in a meeting with a foreign journalists, uh, when he was asked, what do you mean by subversive? He, uh, he said, uh, subversives are not only the people who use violence, but also, and he listed six or seven categories, guess what the first category was? Lawyers who represent them, lawyers who defend them. So. There's, there's, it's no surprise that uh, at least 125 lawyers from Argentina are counted among the disappeared even today. And, an, and a similar number, uh, 125, maybe 130, uh, spent years in detention without trial under the state of siege, as, it, uh, as the constitution says. Um, and uh, countless uh, others, uh, either went into exile for many years or went into a very sad uh, internal exile, you know, uh, lying low and hoping for the storm to, to, uh, to, to pass, but not being able to do much uh, to, uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, but there were also generations of lawyers who uh, first were very, you know, even celebrity lawyers who were so uh, admired, especially by law students for what they were doing, but then they they became themselves uh, victims of murder, of, of uh, bomb attacks, etc. And so younger generations, like in my case, I was, you know, maybe three or four years out of law school, uh, and we were taking on some uh, uh, defenses in very difficult conditions already before the coup d'etat. Uh, but I want to mention it because uh, among those smaller groups of younger lawyers uh, of whom I was a part, uh, uh, at least seven of my dear friends and colleagues are counted also among the disappeared, just because uh, I, uh, you know, uh, by some stroke of luck, I was arrested before they had the policy of disappearances in place. Uh, whereas my friends who some of them defended me even, uh, you know, uh, were, were caught in the web uh, afterwards. Uh, and, and even after the military took over, where not even younger lawyers could do much, uh, we had people whose families had been uh, affected by disappearances, like Emilio Mignone and Augusto Conte McDonald, uh, very prominent lawyers themselves with uh, legal careers from before, and who took on this uh, defense uh, uh, in, 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 in different ways, of, of course. 
Um, what is uh, uh, what we're not going to need to admit, however, is that there was silence, but it was a silence of the corporate uh, bar associations, etc., and not all of them. Um, the, the more the most notable silence was from those who were in a position to uh, affect the course of events and perhaps uh, ameliorate the tragedies because they had connections, because they had access to the military regime, uh, and because they benefited from what the military regime uh, instituted as economic policies. I'm, I'm referring to uh, the Colegio de Abogados de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires, uh, which is um, uh, an association, it's a bar association, but it's an elite bar association that you, it's not open to membership by people who have a law degree or who practice law. Uh, it, the membership is by invitation only. And yes, there are very good lawyers there, excellent lawyers. They're very, um, very prominent and sometimes very admired, uh, some of them. Uh, but they also had, in the worst moments of repression, had the opportunity to do uh, something about these things. And uh, as uh, Steve uh, uh, Cass uh, knows, because he was a member of that mission, uh, but, uh, of the New York Bar Association, chaired by the uh, well-remembered Orville Schell and Marvin Frankel. Uh, the dialogue with the Colegio de Abogados, also called the Colegio de Abogados of the Calle Montevideo, because that's where they have their building, um, was um, very disappointing in that sense. Uh, and uh, the report of that mission that was published in 1978, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has some uh, very uh, powerful words bring, uh, uh, taking to task the, their peers in Argentina for not taking on the defense of their colleagues that were persecuted. Um, there, were also, there was also later on, I think a year later or two years later, uh, a, a meeting of um, uh, uh, patent and in intellectual property lawyers uh, worldwide was held in Buenos Aires. And a couple of lawyers, uh, one American and one Dutch, uh, uh, succeeded in reading a statement uh, uh, decrying the repression of their co uh, colleagues in Argentina, which of course uh, must have uh, been a source of shame for uh, their, their, their hosts because of, uh, of their silence. But I have to say that not all bar associations were silent. For example, the first time I was arrested, I was arrested twice. But the first time that I was arrested, the president of the bar association of my city in Mar del Plata went with my wife to the federal police where I was being held and demanded that I be released or be interviewed. They didn't allow him, but he, uh, that same night uh, drafted a statement, a public a press release decrying in the name of the Colegio de Abogados of my city, uh, the fact that I had been arrested and my wife was not able to see me. So, and that, that uh, man was uh, a very conservative uh, lawyer, but a very decent man and a very uh, committed person. Later on, uh, he became, um, president of the Argentine Federation of Bar Associations, which is of course, by all means, the, the largest uh, 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 corporate organization. And while being president already in the late 1970s, the FACA, as it's called uh, for its acronym in Spanish, um, uh, issued very strong statements against the repression and particularly the repression of lawyers, but also uh, the lack of independence of the judiciary judiciary, etc. And uh, I have to, to think that Bernal, uh, Reinero Bernal is the name of this lawyer, uh, was not an isolated case because uh, uh, the FACA is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the closest thing that we have to the American Bar Association, but it is a federation. So a federation of all uh, individual uh, bar associations, state and local bar associations. And so the decision-making is complex and difficult and get, getting to an agreement. So by then, uh, I'm sure that Bernal uh, had a lot of allies because otherwise uh, that state, those statements that I just mentioned would not have happened. 
Um, with regards to Chile, I think uh, more or less the same, except that in Chile, the, the corporations of the professions uh, stood up to Pinochet from the start, particularly the, the medical associations, as I remember. Uh, and I'm not sure about the, about the lawyers or the bar association, uh, but I, uh, uh, especially because the judiciary uh, in Chile was already so conservative and so uh, right wing that Pinochet didn't have to change many people in the judiciary as the military in Argentina had, had, uh, had done. Um, however, uh, again, there were uh, excellent lawyers, very brave lawyers and very, uh, very committed lawyers who not from uh, bar associations, but certainly from NGOs and particularly under the cover of the Catholic Church in Chile did wonderful work, uh, not, not only documenting the violations, but also uh, representing and 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 for, uh, some of them paid with imprisonment and arbitrary arrest and forced exile for doing that. I'm, I remember my very good friend uh, Jose Salaquet as one of them, who actually organized the legal work of the Catholic Church that has been you know renowned around the world for how to stand up to repression. And I also remember uh, another friend with with whom I also work. Roberto Garreton, who was the first director of uh, the legal team uh, of uh, the Vicaria de Solidaridad. Um, the, uh, uh, in, in, in other countries, uh, you know, lawyers have, uh, in, in other Latin American countries, I mean, lawyers have pay, paid a very heavy price and are still paying a heavy price. Um, but we remember cases uh, from lawyers persecuted in Peru during the war against Sendero Luminoso. Uh, in Colombia, for years and years, the lawyers have been uh, listed among the disappeared and the murdered uh, for representing uh, cases of the sort. In Guatemala, um, the same. Um, and even and nowadays, when the, the, the uh, rise of authoritar authoritarianism is affecting other countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua and El Salvador. Uh, we also have cases of lawyers bravely trying to uh, uh, defend the better traditions of our profession and paying a price uh, for, for, for doing so. Um, I, I, I only want to finish, uh, I'm sorry to go on so long, but I want to uh, conclude with uh, a reflection on uh, we would never know, of course, but if those bar associations and those lawyers with prominent credentials and access to power uh, had actually stood up for at least for the uh, independence of their colleagues, uh, if, if no other thing, whether we would have had um, uh, uh, you know, less tragic outcomes. Uh, as I said, we will never know. Uh, but I think uh, these are the lessons that we have learned. And the lessons that we have learned is that the defense of our profession coming from abroad was at least a, a, a decent substitute for the lack of defense coming from in, uh, uh, within our own ranks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Juan, for those illuminating remarks. I look forward to uh, having an opportunity to follow up um, in a short while. Uh, as Marcy Khan indicated, Katerina Barley was unable to join us this evening, but graciously um, allowed me to interview her several days ago about the role of the German bar in the lead up to, during, and in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, before we show the video of my interview, let me say just a few words of introduction. Katerina Barley is Vice President of the European Parliament, a member of its Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and a substitute member of the Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs. She previously served as a member of the German Bundestag, as Secretary General of the Social Democratic Party, Federal Minister for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth, Acting Federal Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, 
and of particular relevance to this program as federal minister of justice and for consumer protection. Um, Ms. Barley is also in her own words, a quote, lawyer by passion as well as training. In her career, uh, before her career in politics and public service, she worked as an attorney and later as a judge in Germany. Themes of social justice, democracy, and the rule of law have been core themes of her public service. In recent years, she's been at the forefront of EU efforts to address the systematic dismantling of the rule of law by leaders of some EU member states. So let's listen to her reflections on the role and responsibilities of the bar in Germany, as well as the singular challenges that lawyers now face in confronting rising support for authoritarian figures and tactics. Excuse me, I, I gather I'm not the only one who isn't hearing sound. That, that's, that's right, uh, Diane, and uh, we're going to see if we can uh, get our, our technical expert to uh, correct that. Okay. I will look for guidance from the organizers, but if we don't get this uh, sorted out relatively soon, perhaps I'll turn to I'm, Professor Shepard. I'm sorry about that. Is, is it working now? Yeah. I have the screen. You could see the screen. Okay, it should work now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for participating in this program of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York which as you know, uh, will explore a vitally important question. What role should the legal profession play in addressing contemporary efforts to undermine democracy through processes that are at least ostensibly legal? As we explore this issue, the experience of Germany is a particularly important reminder of the extreme risks of a legal system that facilitates lawless power. In the words of U.S. Prosecutor Telford Taylor, defendants uh, from the Nazi judicial system, quote, engaged in an unholy masquerade of tyranny. They disguised as justice and converted the German judicial system into an engine of despotism and slaughter. Um, end quote. So I want to begin by asking you to help us understand what role did the German bar play as the Nazis rose to power and transformed the judiciary itself into a ruthless instrument of persecution? Well, first of all, thank you very much for addressing this so important topic, especially in, in these days. Um, I've been working on this in, in all sorts of senses and, and professions, so it's really, really important, especially also to our to our youth, I mean, to, to, to talk to students about this, about the dangers that lie, I would say, a bit in um, the, the studies or the profession of law by itself, because what you learn is to apply laws. It's uh, it is written well in in Europe more than in the U.S., of course, but you have them, and and you're supposed to to go in line with them. So so to raise this spirit of really asking, is this is everything still still okay in this system? Okay. Um, that is something that you really have to spark. It's not in the system by itself in the judicial one. So. So the, the judicial professions as a whole being, um, I would say, 
more endangered um, to fall into traps of, of authoritarianism and dictatorship. The German bar um, was uh, absolutely, the situation was as in many professions that, uh, that Jewish profess professionals, in this case, Jewish lawyers, uh, were, were very, had a very good reputation very often. Um, three quarters of the, of the lawyers in Berlin were Jews. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the countryside, not so many, but, but Jews were, formed a, a big part of, um, of, this, of this bar. And um, so, and there were very many uh, lawyers and it was a time of economical crisis. So, um, so quite a few of these uh, non-Jewish lawyers saw a chance of really getting rid of, of uh, competition, a very a brilliant competition, you know, of those who really had a very high reputation. Um, and, and so I, I have to say that the bar actually was quite quick in in giving in to this um, to this economical temptation, which there was uh, to to get rid of, of um, all of these Jewish lawyers um, who were not able to um, to exercise uh, their um, their profession um, from a very very early stage on. So and and it was even even worse that the bar as a as a as a body um welcomed the nazis and welcomed the the ideology um and uh yeah and um what what the nazis did in germany i hope i'm not too long here in general was to um uh, to sort of take all the associations that you had in civil society um, and and make them Nazi associations, and the same happened to the bar. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 bar that the German Bar Association dissolved itself and became uh, integrated itself into the Nazi bar, uh, would be translated by Association of National Socialist Lawyers uh, nowadays. So so they did that very willingly. And I'm afraid I have to say also the judges and also all the other judicial professions. After the war, um, did the organized bar in Germany reflect on what you just described? And if so, what came of that? Well, in the beginning, definitely it didn't, like most, um, like most institutions in Germany didn't. They even elected a former Nazi as their uh, leader, as a president. Um, what they did reflect upon quite, quite extensively is, is the role and the, the, the fate of their Jewish colleagues, their, what became of them and how, if they survive, what um, these, these very personal um, history questions, um, but it, other than the justice ministry, which, which I had the honor to, to be the minister in, we have really made a very extensive um, ex examination of what happened and how this could happen. This um, up to now, the, the bar has not done yet, but there are uh, first steps and, and, uh, and first uh, investigations to do so. Can you say a little bit more about how the experiences of World War II have changed the way German lawyers see their role today? Um, for example, have legal ethics codes been revised with a view to ensuring that lawyers never again serve as accomplices, whether actively, as many did, or through silent complicity um, in the face of rising authoritarian tendencies? Well, first of all, as I said, it, it plays a part in, in, in our studies um, to, to reflect on this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there have been a whole lot of, of very good exhibitions and, and, and seminars on, on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the, um, to the Federal Lawyers Act, um, that uh, actually see, uh, has, um, has a, a rule 
that um, if you um, if you fight the free democratic bases of our country, of our the basic order, um, our our constitution in in a punishable manner, then uh, you can be uh, you can be uh, stripped from your uh, right to. Um, to be able to exercise your profession as a lawyer. The interesting thing about this is it is more um, the 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 um, the limit is higher. The level is higher than, for example, for a judge. So um, this this uh, suffix in a in a punishable manner, you don't find that for a judge. So if a judge um, uh, um, works against our our constitution our our fundamental order he can be expelled or she straight away for the for the for lawyers it is a bit um uh you 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 have to do it in a punishable manner which which is a significant difference and of course but, the reason is that 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 even people um who who do the most awful things have the right to have a lawyer so so for that they don't have to be impartial mm -hmm. I see. Um, so for that the difference that's why there is this difference yes of course that makes perfect sense um i just want to end by asking you a couple of really broad questions but they tie into um the broad issues that this panel is exploring um, and both of them relate to the lessons learned which you've of course already touched on but if i could ask you more broadly um first in your view, based on Germans, Germany's experience, are there times when attorneys have an affirmative obligation to defend democracy, democratic principles, when they see a serious threat to a constitutional system? Um, we don't have any legal uh, provision for this, that you really actively have to do something. It is. It, um, the provision is that you must not uh, work against it or try to overturn the democratic order. This is this is the our rule. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask sort of the flip side of that question. Perhaps you just answered it, which is, are is there a line beyond which no attorney should go? Um, and if so, where would you draw that line? Again, drawing on um, the experience of Nazi Germany. Yes, that's that's of course a good question. I mean, uh, we here in Germany, as as everywhere else in the world, have people who who we could call um, domestic terrorists or whatever. So people who really want to to make this a dictatorship again or or. Um, uh, a fascist state, um, and of course the question is how how you as a lawyer um, act uh, when you when you are confronted with with this with these people. But we believe that it, these people also have the right to um, to have a, a lawyer, a, a good lawyer, even uh, that that is part of our our judicial system. So. You would never, um, in Germany, for example, prohibit anyone to defend these people or to to um, to give them advice. Um, so, f for me personally, and it goes in line with with what I said about our ethics um, ethic rules, is that uh, you yourself must be faithful to the the values of our democratic state. So separation of power and um well all the all the democratic principles that we have you have to be faithful to them well we have a saying i don't know if you say that in in america too where injustice becomes justice resistance becomes duty so so that do, it does not only hold true for lawyers it holds true for everyone but the danger about this of course is that people who do not believe in our democratic values, but in other ones, that they see our acting, our fight for democracy, our fight for equality, for freedom, as injustice. Mm -hmm. we, we are in this very specific time of, of disinformation mm -hmm. um, where, where, for example, when it comes to the pandemic, people really do believe that 
the government is doing all sorts of awful things. So I think this is the big challenge that we are facing. Um, we do not only have to set up laws that are good, we really have to dig deeper. We really have to implement these values of respect, of, of um, yeah, equality in every sense, of freedom deep in our uh, society, also with the young, because, because so many are being misled at the moment to believe that the wrong things are the justice um, that they have to um, seek for also by, by violent acts. Um, obviously, uh, a powerful interview. Um, Katerina Barley had so many um, important insights. I hope we have a chance, even uh, though she won't be able to join us, to discuss some of the issues she raised. Um, some of her last points, I think, dovetail with uh, nicely with the scholarship of our um, next speaker. Um, I, uh, I few scholars have um, done more than our next speaker uh, to understand and educate the rest of us um, about the dynamics behind the rise of the new autocrats um, that I mentioned earlier, who use the trappings of legal process to eviscerate democratic government and governance, uh, excuse me, and who have um, used these techniques uh, to pick up on the final point um, that Katerina Barley made. Uh, they've used these techniques in a way that really drains the law of its principles, of its um, value commitments that um, are crucial to the rule of law. Um, so Prof Professor Kim Lane Shepley is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University and is a faculty fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Carey School of Law, where she previously taught for 10 years. She's also been a visiting law professor at Yale and Harvard Law Schools in this country and at the Central European University in Budapest, Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and Humboldt University in Berlin. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Professor Shepley studied the emergence of constitutional law in Hungary and Russia, living in both countries for extended periods and working in their respective constitutional courts as a researcher. Then as these countries move sharply toward autocracy, she has chronicled the use of law and the role of lawyers in consolidating power in both countries. And she's tracked the spread of what she calls legalistic autocracy around the world, including elements of this phenomenon in the United States. Her book about these trends, Destroying Democracy by Law will be published by Harvard University in 2024. I hope that they um, get ahead of their own deadline and publish it sooner because we need this book. Um, Professor Shepley's expertise has been widely recognized and honored in the academy, by governments, and by journalists. She is the go-to expert on Hungary and on creeping autocracy in many other countries, uh, and is a frequent consultant to European Union institutions and foreign ministries of EU member states as they struggle with how to contain autocracy emerging in the middle of the European Union. Professor Shepley, we're delighted you could be here tonight. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm really delighted to join this panel. Also to speak to the Bar Association of the City of New York, which really has an extraordinary willingness to look beyond the boundaries of the US and to take away lessons for the US as well. Since I've been teaching for multiple years in the pandemic now, what I always do when I get on Zoom is show slides. So I hope you don't mind uh, that I brought some slides to share with you um, and to be able to use these slides to talk about, um, do you have, uh, can you see it? Yeah, um, I got some strange thing on my Zoom. Um, so let me start by saying that it's precisely because people like Juan Mendez and Katerina Barley have done so much to call our attention to the horrors of the Nazi regime, the Argentinian junta, that current autocrats don't do those kinds of things anymore, or at least they don't do those kinds of things very early on. Instead, these days, when democracy fails, it fails by law. And uh, as, uh, as Diane mentioned, 
I'm sometimes a law professor, sometimes a social scientist. So I want to hit you with a couple of social science slides just to tell you kind of where we are in the process of this kind of global transformation of democracy. This is a chart. It's very busy. It's actually fairly easy to read once you know how to do it. There's a group called the Varieties of Democracy Project based in Stockholm, Sweden, and they have been looking at the decline of democracy for some time. This is a chart they put together from their 2020 report. And along the axis on the bottom, it measures what they call liberal democracy. That's what I'm sure every lawyer on this call would call constitutionalism. It measures effective checks on executive power, separation of power, judicial independence, electoral, being, you know, having free and fair elections and respect for rights. So there's a kind of index that measures all of those things. Um, and what this chart shows you is along the bottom axis, the scores that different countries got on that index in 2009. And on the axis on the side, it shows you the scores from those same countries in 2019. So it's 10 years of change. And if a country didn't change, it's on the line. If a country got better, it's above the line. And if a country got worse, it's below the line. That's why this is such a seductive chart. And particularly if you look at the kind of top half of the scale, those are countries that actually were doing quite well in terms of sort of constitutional principles. And what you see is how many countries have fallen. The farther away a country is from the line, the farther it's fallen. Um, and so this is really what we're now thinking about as a kind of global crisis of democratic backsliding. And of course, the US is not immune from this. And I think it was Marcy that pointed out earlier, the, uh, I guess it's not a tweet, the social media communication from our former president that calls for the termination of, among other things, the constitution. So the US is not out of the woods yet on this. So just a couple more social science points before I tell you some more concrete things about Hungary in particular. Um, and that is that one of the things that we, I think that many people still believe is that when democracies die, they die by something like coups, right? So we talk about tanks in the streets, you know, and as long as there aren't tanks in the streets, then we must be okay. And I wanna try to disabuse you of that idea. This is a chart that shows you um, the number of coups in any given year. The gray are the attempts, the red are the successful ones. And the shaded in gray area, which I think you can probably see with my cursor here, tells you about how much that, how much, how many coups happened during the time of the Cold War. And what you see is that coups were pretty much the dominant way that democracies failed during the Cold War. But from the end of the Cold War on, the number of governments that have been toppled by something like a coup, uh, even coup attempts have gone way down. Now it's ticked up a little bit in the last couple of years. This ends in 2016, but coups aren't the way that democracies die anymore. So then how do they die? This is a little bit of a, I wish they had better colors on this graph, but this is also from the Varieties of Democracy Project. And it takes you through three time periods. Those three bars are three time periods. And it looks at what they call um, uh, extensions of executive power. So sort of major power grabs by the executive and they code them according to how they were achieved. So there's illegal access to power. That's like coups in black what they call legal access through a major extension in purple. And those are sort of constitutional, sort of brand new constitutional processes. The gray are legal access with minor extensions. So just the legislature gives the executive additional powers. And the blue is legal access with no formal change. In other words, power grabs by the executive that happened by the executive triggering powers that were already there in law. The three bars are three different time periods. So the leftmost one, the first wave is, is prior to and during the first world war, the second world war, I'm sorry. And what you see, it's mostly coups and then big constitutional transformations. The second graph is that cold war graph, which again, mostly coups are you know, responsible for major changes in executive power. And the third wave, which has happened since the end of the cold war is where we are now. And this is where things have really radically changed. By and large, when executives get lots of additional unchecked power, they're getting it through law. So the number of coups is way down. And they're getting it through relatively minor changes in laws, which is to say that the way that democracy dies now is by law, which leads me to say that, you know, we're no longer expecting tanks in the streets. What we're expecting are 
phalanxes of lawyers. Basically, when democracy dies these, these days, it dies a legal death. And there is no place where you see that better than in Hungary, which I wanted to tell you about in a little more sort of qualitative detail. And Hungary matters, first of all, because it's acted as kind of a model for a number of other countries going down the same path. But Hungary is also important because of the immensely strong ties between the Trump faction of the Republican Party and Viktor Orban and his team. As you probably know, CPAC had one of its first foreign meetings in Hungary this summer, and Viktor Orban was one of the keynote speakers at the CPAC meeting uh, here in Texas in August. And there are many connections between the Trump folks and the Orban folks, which I can tell you about if you want to know. I mentioned it now just because the things that have been happening in Hungary, you're starting to see some blowback back into the US. So busy slide, but let me just say that Viktor Orban came to power in a free and fair election in 2010. And since that time, between 2010 and 2018, Hungary fell from a what the political scientists call a consolidated democracy, democracy in good standing, to what the political scientists call an electoral autocracy, which is a country that goes through the motions of having elections, but you're never in doubt about who wins, which is to say it's no longer a democracy. And every step of this fall from grace, so to speak, was done through law. So Viktor Orban came to power in 2010. He decided to write a new constitution, which he pushed through with the support of only his party, hacked the constitutional court by adding additional seats, changing the rules about elections of constitutional judges, captured virtually all of the, actually all of the independent institutions, especially the prosecutor, audit office, electoral commission, media board, et cetera, attack civil society organizations, by the way, by copying the U.S.'s FARA law and requiring civil society organizations to declare all their foreign sources of support and then demonizing them when they did so, attacks on academic freedom. Some of you know that Central European University was pushed out of the country, but what's been even more devastating is the privatization of state universities, putting them in the hands of cronies of the prime minister and I think we're about to see a major purge of faculty um, in the coming year. Um, so then, sorry, there's a there's a there's a there's of course a call in the background. Sorry about that. Um, so then, you know, silencing of critical media, xenophobic, anti-Roma, anti-migrant, anti-Semitic, anti-EU mass campaigns, and then massive corruption financed by EU funds. And then, once Orban was in power, they changed the election law so that there has not been a free and fair election since that time. All right, so in all of this, let me get to our point. So where were the lawyers? And the answer was, they were all writing the laws. So Hungary, like many countries, has sort of two bars. There's the international bar, big international firms that practice in these places. But the local bar, the small private law firms all over the country, were actually enlisted while Viktor Orban was out of power between 2002 in 2010, those private law firms were hired to write this blitz of legislation that Orban pushed through the parliament in just a few years. There were thousands of pages of laws, and they were all you know, written in this piecemeal fashion by different private law firms, many of which probably didn't see how their particular puzzle piece fit into the whole. But because there were so many lawyers implicated in writing the blueprint for this government, the Hungarian Bar Association said nothing. And every step of this descent into autocracy was legal, which is to say this is a very different form of repression. Now, I wanted to, because I had seen Katarina Barley's interview before you all did, um, what I wanted to say is this is not typical for lawyers in Hungary. Um, back in 1920, when Hungary passed a numerous clauses law that limited the number of Jews in the profession, and yes, Hungary had these laws on the books before Nazi Germany was Nazi Germany. In Hungary, when this happened, the lawyers banded together, changed the names of their Jewish colleagues, gave them new legal identities, and protected them in the continued practice of law. This book is all about that, in case any of you want to read about that. Lawyers were very brave when all of this happened in the 1920s. And now there still are some lawyers who have been active, but actually very few. So there are some human rights lawyers. So the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, uh, the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, uh, the Ifesh Kato Intezet, the Amnesty International, Transparency International, there are a couple of others. 
they've been very active, <laughs> excuse me, but they've been targeted with threats, audits, and laws that I said criminalize their receipt of foreign funds. A small group of lawyers has formed something called the Association of Lawyers for Democracy and the Rule of Law. Tiny, tiny group, and their members have been sort of demonized by the rest of the bar. Um, but lawyers have also been targeted. One of the reasons lawyers aren't brave is that they see what happens if they are brave. And so one of the goals of the government has been to kind of keep the lawyers in check. So one of the first things the government did was to remove all fellowships from students who wanted to study law unless they went to one of two approved state law schools where the faculties had already been full, filled with these state lawyers who were generating this program. So now young human rights lawyers or lawyers who want to actually practice law in a more intellectually or internationally respectable manner leave the country and they go elsewhere. Um, there have been, you know, at least 10 lawyers in Hungary who have been targeted with Pegasus software. But, so the government puts the software on their phone. This is the software that allows the government to listen to all of their conversations, including with clients. The head of the Hungarian Bar Association had his phone targeted with Pegasus. And his reaction as the reaction of all the other lawyers was, oh, I guess I'm not surprised they wanted to listen to my conversations with clients. And they did not challenge it. There have been some human rights lawyers who have taken these Pegasus and other surveillance cases to the Court of Human Rights. There are now two decisions out of the Court of Human Rights that say, no, the government shouldn't be able to bug lawyers. <laughs> um, and the Hungarian government simply hasn't complied with the decision and the EU has ignored the non-compliance. So what about the other part of the bar? <laughs> what about the international law firms? And the answer is absolutely none of them have said anything. So a couple of them are still there. So Baker McKenzie, if you look at their Budapest headquarters website, they're celebrating their 30th, 5th anniversary. Other law firms have kind of snuck away. So Freshfields closed actually in the financial crisis. Weil Gottschall uh, closed down its office in 2018. White and Case merged their practice with Denton's. And actually, I love this picture because what it says in Hungarian is still water, chendishpies. And that's sort of the way all the law firms have acted. So one of the challenges I pose here, since a lot of you probably work for firms that have at least some business in that part of the world or some business in other countries that are actually going through this kind of autocratic decline is can't the international bar do more? And I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question, um, uh, Professor Shepley, that you covered so much ground, but I would love to hear more about your um, sense of what impact lawyers can have if they speak up. Um, and and uh, as part of that, whether there are, um, sorry, apologies, I just noticed I wasn't on screen, whether um, you detect moments of um, particular opportunity, what I have in mind here is, um, in the field of atrocities prevention, there's kind of an idea of a rising um, uh, line of risk and a moment where maybe um, early in that rise, you can interrupt um, the trajectory by intervention of an effective kind. Do you see moments looking back in Hungary and in similar countries where if the, the bar either in the country or the foreign bar had spoken up, there could have been a significant impact? And I'd like to, after you speak, um, also ask the same question of Juan, who alluded to this question um, in the closing of his remarks. Yeah, so I think there are a number of things the international bar can do. So, you know, the first is that Hungary is a member of the EU. It's in all the exclusive clubs. It's a member of NATO. It's an ally of you know, the United States and others. The international bar could say something when Hungary starts to go, shall we say, below the bar in its standards across the board for, well, I mean, there's a limit to what they can do because of their membership in the EU. But when the, when the government was starting to consolidate this new constitution, one thing I didn't mention, Hungary declared a state of emergency in March 2020 for the pandemic. And it's found various ways to extend that state of emergency since. So ever since that time, the prime minister has had the capacity to overrule any law by decree. You would think <laughs> some of these decrees have actually affected international firms. So one of the decrees, for example, 
swapped out the board of a publicly traded Hungarian company listed on the Hungarian Stock Exchange. Just by decree, one day the board is gone, new, new board. Nobody said anything. The company is still traded. The Whatever their law firm was said nothing about any of this. So there are things affecting the clients of these international firms that they could speak out about. But here's the thing that I think would be the most helpful. So the European Union actually in the next, we thought they were going to decide today, but now it's probably going to be next week or the week after, is finally closing in on Hungary and threatening to cut their funds. And it's been extremely hard. I, that's the issue that I've been working on going back and forth between the Hungarian lawyers and the EU lawyers. The Hungarian human rights lawyers don't know EU law. They know the human rights law. They can take cases to Strasbourg. But if, a, if the country doesn't follow up, doesn't comply with the Strasbourg decisions, which Hungary doesn't do, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If they don't comply with decisions of the EU, of the Court of Justice and following sort of EU law, the EU has real sanctions that can be brought to bear. So I've been trying to get the human rights lawyers to pivot and start thinking in EU law terms to start aiming their legal challenges, their publicity, everything else at the EU. And the only people who know EU law in Hungary are in the international law firms. So why don't they run seminars for the human rights lawyers, right? To teach them the EU law they need to try to get some leverage from the one international organization that really holds Hungary's future in its hands because the EU controls all their money. So EU law seminars for Hungarian human rights lawyers, that's one thing and I can think of more things. Brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna come back to you and ask a, another follow-up question, but Juan, if I could turn back to you and ask um, for some lessons learned on what might've actually had an impact because we, we I think, have a, a common understanding of what we would hope lawyers would do, but can you, in retrospect, think of moments where if um, uh, the Colegio Avogados that you mentioned, if they had stood up and said something, what might have happened? I know we can't know that. We can't know the answer, as you've already indicated, but what's your sense? No, my sense is that, uh, you know, in, in, in specific cases, they, they could have, you know, uh, persuaded the military junta to release lawyers who spent four or five years, maybe they would have spent two years mm -hmm. in, uh, in detention without trial, in arbitrary, prolonged arbitrary detention. Um, I'm not sure that they would have had that effect and nobody can know, uh, but um, I think in fact, uh, uh, because they had access and because uh, they were considered uh, key to the policy, the economic policies and the international trade uh, policies of the junta, um, they would have had leverage. Uh, we will never know because they didn't even try. But um, uh, I'm, I'm persuaded that they they, they could have. Uh, uh, as it happened, uh, and, uh, and this is not only true of Argentina, but as it happened, uh, it was the international bar and particularly the New York Bar Association, but also um, the uh, American Bar Association, because at the time when I arrived, in the United States and the dictatorship in Argentina was still in full swing. The American Bar Association already had a program to defend lawyers persecuted for their professions all over the world. And they, I know they did some work on um, uh, colleagues and friends of mine uh, because I asked them to do it and others asked them to do it, of course. And I know that they did the best they could to um, you know, uh, ask questions about disappeared uh, lawyers uh, in Argentina and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it was a time when uh, the, those uh, initiatives had some repercussion because they were, uh, you know, highlighted in the press in, in the United States and, and in Europe, uh, but they also, they were also uh, committed voices in favor of human rights uh, in Congress, um, even on both sides of the aisle. Uh, those things are long gone, unfortunately. And, and um, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but now if there is any initiative in Congress uh, on human rights abroad, 
is generally to uh, very partisan to defend friends, but uh, uh, or to attack enemies, uh, but with no sense of the need to hold uh, up human rights uh, for what they are. I mean, uh, somebody that everybody is entitled to, and um, the same the same goes for defending the profession. If we defend lawyers only when they're attacked by uh, countries that we consider enemies, that's, you know, that's of course important to do anyway. But if we don't do it also when uh, it's our allies that persecute lawyers, then uh, we lose all credibility. Kim, if I could uh, turn back to you, um, part of what uh, the power of your scholarship in this space has been um, your diagnosis of what's happening. And when I read your scholarship, it all seems so clear, but part of the point of your work is that it, it isn't clear. Um, and as you said earlier, the tactics of the new autocrats aren't as heavy handed, um, char characteristically aren't as heavy handed um, as some of the earlier precedents we've talked about this evening. So diagnosis is the first step, recognizing the warning signs. Um, and as some of us have talked about before this program, we're seeing them everywhere. We're focusing on a few um, uh, notable countries tonight, but um, in the past few days alone, um, I've seen at least two articles in the New York Times uh, and elsewhere about persecution of lawyers um, in countries that we don't read about very often, Fiji. Um, and in Hong Kong, as we talked about also um, before the program. So diagnostics is key, but then action. Um, I love your suggestion about um, international law firms providing training on EU law. Um, what, to ask a naive question, um, what's holding back big law firms, the ones you mentioned um, earlier from speaking out more? And I, you know, I, can, I can speculate about the reasons, but I'd rather hear your analysis. And if you have other suggestions for an agenda, um, we'd love to hear them. Yeah, so, I mean, so first of all, um, in many countries, the government is the biggest client mm -hmm. of some of these firms. Um, and government regulatory strategy affects both the firms and their clients, their abilities to operate and many other things. Um, and so what you see, I think, is, is law firms willing to put up with the fact that they're working in autocratic countries um, you know, you get a, a country, again, I, I keep thinking of Hungary, but this is not the only one that does this. You have a country that'll have sort of an international economy, which is operating more or less along familiar kinds of lines. And the autocracy happens below that, right? It happens at the level of capture, oligarch capture of, you know, small businesses that don't have international links and so on. And so the more a country can detach, it's sort of international um, you know, foreign direct investment slice of the economic pie from the rest. Autocracies are now building in that domestic space when the international law firms are operating in the other space that doesn't see it as much. And part of that is deliberate. Autocracy is local, right? You want to capture all the local resources. You can do that without affecting this international level. And everybody is sort of in agreement that, you know, as long as international corporations, I mean, Germany holds up the Hungarian economy. You know, many German cars are manufactured in Hungary. They just got, Hungary just got a huge plant from, battery plant from China, the largest one outside of China and so on. And Hungary lets those companies and their law firms operate as if they were in any democratic country. So everybody acts like we don't need to mention all of this. So then what can these companies do? Well, you know, I urge this on universities and let me urge this on international law firms too. A lot of the local lawyers, the ones that don't have the international connections are really finding it very hard to operate in these situations. Um, and just like, you know, my own university this year took in 15, well, academic refugees from Ukraine and uh, several from Russia who had sort of burned their bridges and left. We were able to take them in so they could actually, you know, survive. I've been trying to take in Hungarian lawyers, right? Let's maybe some of the law firms can look around and look at some of these lawyers who've been very outspoken and brave and defend them by hiring them onto staff. You know, these are 
a lot of these are the best lawyers in the countries and the places that I know. This was also true in Russia when I worked there when things were before things got as bad as they are now. Um, and so hire local talent into the law firm. You can protect them that way because these governments won't go after the big law firms. They'll go after local unprotected folks. The other thing is to find ways to partner with some of the brave organizations that are really standing up to, you know, these local, um, to these local autocrats. Uh, but I, let me just mention one thing, because I didn't mention it in my, in my talk. Juan had, had sort of uh, hinted at this before. One of the ways autocracies worked is that, of course, they corrupt the courts. And so you don't have independent judiciaries anymore. And that's something that really affects the practice of law firms. Now, it affects the practices of big law firms less, international law firms less than it used to, precisely because international arbitration was everybody's answer to how not to deal with corrupt local courts. And the prominence of international arbitration means that international firms don't care as much about the corruption of local courts, about the fact that local courts have been captured. Um, and so it seems to me that one of the things Again, that, that international firms that have a lot more heft than the local lawyers can do is to start paying a lot more attention to what's happening in the local judiciary and to try to stand up for the local, um, for the local judiciary. One last thing, the International Bar Association was actually very active with regard to Hungary. They sent delegations in, they wrote two big reports that were highly influential in the EU in pointing out that Hungary's judiciary had really come under political capture. And so sometimes even coming in and just publicizing, you know, the state of the judiciary, the state of the bar um, is also very helpful because it allows other international actors to act, but they don't have the fact finding capacity. Sometimes bar associations do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. Um, so uh, I hear several um, themes coming out. One is that, at the very least, um, offer protection to courageous lawyers who are under pressure, um, and even firms that uh, may have economic interest in not speaking up can provide protection, um, can find ways to provide protection, as can Bar Association, as, as this Bar Association has for decades, um, to courageous lawyers. Of course, we want to go um, beyond that and tackle the systemic reasons these lawyers are persecuted, um, there are complex challenges um, there, but, but I hear you saying that if we're smart and strategic and understand the game, um, we can find solutions, we can publicize um, the dynamics and then use that information as uh, with institutions that do have leverage, like the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, we can you know, uh, be creative in ways that are savvy based on uh, the kind of diagnosis and uh, analysis you have you and other scholars have provided. Um, I wanna see if, uh, I, I believe Marcy has been monitoring um, questions that have been sent in. I wanna see if uh, there are any that you'd like to raise, Marcy. Sure, um, I actually am going to start with uh, uh, one of my own uh, for uh, Kim Shepley. Uh, uh, taking the focus back here to the United States, um, uh, I believe you've mentioned to us in, in preparation for tonight's program that um, Mr. Orban has uh, developed some English-speaking think tanks uh, in Hungary uh, to uh, entice not just uh, the CPAC revelers, but actually real scholars from English speaking countries to come and then take his learning back home. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? And of course, I'm gonna say, what should we as lawyers be doing to, um, uh, it, it, with regard to that? Yeah, so Victor Orban built this thing, uh, it's called the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, which is a, it's like a training ground for young, party members. So it's really a party state now. And once he realized that this is a very effective training tool, he then decided to open it up to an international audience. So he's now created something called the Danube Institute. You can Google this. And it's headed by um, the former editor of the National Review, a publication that may be familiar to many Americans on this call. Um, this is now the English language version of that Hungarian um, institution that Orban created, and they bring in fellows, and they've had a rotation of fellows from the US, the UK, and Australia, um, sort of the Trump faction from here. Um, and some of them are lawyers, 
And they come in and they do English language courses alongside the party training apparatus in Hungary. And then they bring these ideas back. So, you know, it's, it really is now much more institutionalized. Um, might I also say that I think in some cases there were a lot of direct communications between the Trump administration and folks in the Orban orbit. So just to give you one example that happened in the U.S., if we think about the immigration policy at the southern border under uh, former President Trump, um, I will give you the steps that Orban used in Hungary, and those of you who recall what was done here will recognize them. Step one, build a wall. Step two, push all the people who want to come in on the other side of the wall so they have to wait in the neighboring country in order to be able to be granted asylum in the country. Reduce the number of asylum judges so that you increase the backlog of, of cases so that, in fact, people wind up waiting forever. Then um, for anyone who crosses the border, you have a mandatory detention policy, which quickly overloads your, your facilities for capturing people. You then declare a state of emergency because you can't, in fact, hold everybody. Um, and then you start depriving the people you're holding of various crucial things. And as a last stage, you separate the kids from the parents. In Hungary, the idea was you only have to feed the kids under international law. You don't have to feed their parents. So they separated the kids, fed them, and then gave them back to starving parents in the border. Okay, so think about that set of events. It was almost exactly what happened here. It happened about a year later here than it happened there. So there are these legal formulas that are actually traveling, you know, from one country to another, from Hungary to here. And the Danube Institute is one of the mechanisms through which now a whole cadre of American conservatives are being trained in how Orban does all this stuff. Wow. Uh, this question was uh, directed to Diane, uh, but I, I, I take the... Uh, uh, answer from uh, all three of you, really. Uh, what is meant by an attorney acting in a punishable manner? That was what um, Katerina Barley described in Germany. Yeah. Uh, I, it's unfair to put it to the three of you. Because Actually, I know the answer to that here. one. <laughs> so, since I occasionally teach law in Germany. Um, so what that means is that what the way the statute goes is that if a lawyer has committed something that would be punishable as a criminal offense, then they're sort of automatically disbarred once they're convicted. So that's, that's what that formulation meant. Um, but as she said, for a judge, all a judge has to do is show essentially sympathy for you know, undermining the, what the Germans call the free basic democratic order. And then there's a disciplinary procedure to inquire into whether this judge can really be a, an advocate for the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's also a request for um, the uh, the full report um, Vice President Barley uh, referenced. If we could get a link to that and to any of the studies that she mentioned, we could post them on our website um, soon. Uh, and I'm wondering if that is possible. Uh, Diane, do you know? Yeah, I think I did post a link to the principal uh, a report of the principal project that she was referring to. It's called the Rosenberg Project and it was undertaken by the Ministry of Justice. If somebody could check um, the Q&A and see if that link came across. It was founded, I believe, or, or launched, I believe in uh, 2012. And it's a project that has looked at the role of the Ministry of Justice itself and the continua continuation um, within the ministry of people who played key roles. Um, as, as legal officials uh, in, in the um, Nazi government and continue to serve um, in, in the Ministry of Justice. Yeah. So it began by looking at um, the continuities um, from the Nazi period within the Ministry of Justice itself. Uh, and as, as Ms. Barley indicated, um, there have been efforts uh, to um, educate um, various uh, communities in, in Germany about the findings of the study and the implications for the responsibilities of lawyers and, um, and law students. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure that we get those uh, posted on our website. And I want to mention, uh, because there was a question about what does the rule of law task force do. And at the very first link that is in the chat, which you can see there, even though you can't, uh, you and the audience cannot uh, 
impose oh, no. our website, nycbar.org. Uh, and um, uh, you can see the robust program that we have had for the last three and a half years uh, for the task force on the rule of law. Um, and uh, you can look up our various reports and actually see the videos of our previous, uh, previous programs. Um, uh, but we have called to account uh, uh, many government officials who have threatened uh, the rule of law uh, and lawyers who've done it too. Let me go uh, get, uh, get Juan who has his hand up. Yes, thank you. No, the, 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 if, if we are considering putting up uh, material, I think the, the, um, the mission report uh, written by um, the New York Bar Association in 78 or 79 of the visit to Argentina that I mentioned um, would be an excellent uh, you know, document to have because I think it's unique. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it has very powerful uh, condemnation of violations, but, it, uh, but it's unique in the sense that it's written in a sort of uh, language of dialogue with uh, uh, the, the, uh, the peers of uh, international lawyers. Uh, and, you know, kind of, uh, as, I, as I said in my prepared remarks, um, you know, um, taking them to task for not defending uh, uh, the independence of lawyers. Um, so I think in that, in that sense, it's unique. Of course, there are other uh, important reports uh, uh, of what happened in Argentina in those years. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, focus on the rule of law and particularly on the profession, uh, I, think, uh, I think it stands as, as, a, as an example that I don't know that it has been repeated elsewhere. So um, that was all, uh, all I wanted to, to add. We'll, we'll do that. I believe it's already there, but we'll, we'll post it on the uh, Rule of Law Task Force website in connection with this program. Um, and I, I want to mention also, I know we had technical uh, problems uh, 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 with the broadcast uh, this evening, and I apologize for those. Uh, we are going to, uh, we have been recording it, and we will have uh, the entire uh, program uh, on the website in coming days uh, if, if anybody uh, couldn't connect with, with parts of it. Um, so uh, that, that I want you to know. We're also going to put on the uh, site the uh, report from the uh, City Bar uh, and the uh, International Bar uh, that uh, Diane contributed to in 1986 and 87 when she uh, went on the mission to Chile. Uh, so we'll we'll post that. Uh, that uh, is an important uh, thing to read uh, as well. Kim, you have your hand up, please. Yeah. So I, I could see in the in the questions also that a lot of people are asking what can be done here, and I just want to say that um, one of the things that I find really unsettling about what's happening in the U.S. right now is how similar it feels to what happened in Hungary ten years ago. And let me just reference one thing, because I bet a number of people on this call are experiencing the same set of vertigo, where you say, of course, I will defend the Constitution. And of course, the Supreme Court has the last word on what the Constitution is. And now everybody's saying, but wait a second, I'm not sure I agree with that. <laughs> or what's going to happen next? Or this sense that there's this kind of vertigo because you know the law is going to change very quickly. And so many of us, you know, especially when we're trained to think about the law, assume that we can hide behind the law, right? That somehow the law is the thing that saves you from autocracy and all that stuff. But what happens when, we, when these new autocrats come, come to power, they pack the courts so you can no longer just automatically say the court decision reflects a kind of neutral principled view of justice, but it's, it's become partisan. There are certain laws that you used to stand behind because, of course, as a lawyer, you're supposed to protect and defend the law. And exactly the way this, these new autocrats work to unstabilize everyone is to take the coordinates that lawyers take for granted as the definition of what we do, right? And to make those, flip those things around so they no longer stand for the things that we were taught 
we should believe, right? So what do you do when the principles that you believe in are no longer reflected in the law that you're supposed to follow, right? It's in that pulling apart that all the lawyers get disoriented and many of them go silent. That's why these, these autocratic leaders, they're, they're in some ways more clever than the past generation. You know, if people are being detained and murdered and if you've got a mass genocidal campaign and all of that stuff is visible, of course that's wrong. It's easier to mobilize people to be, well, I mean, if they're affected, maybe not so brave, but it's, eager to mo it's, it's obvious to mobilize international condemnation. But now a government comes to power through what looks like a free and fair election. They change all the laws at once. What do you say about that? What's wrong with that? If everything is legal, but nothing's right anymore. Thanks, so, um, sorry. Yeah. sorry go, no, ahead. go ahead. No, it's just the rule of law. Very, very require good. Point. Uh, Diane, I'm sorry. Go ahead, distance please. from the law. No, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to um, push you a little bit on, on that last point. I, totally agree with your analysis the the i i guess the point i want to push you on is i don't know that lawyers have gone silent or that citizens have gone silent um there there was a huge um outcry about the dobbs decision huge, huge yes. mobilization that was um, a factor in the midterm elections but i think there's also a sense of um, deep frustration about how you respond. And so, so I think there is a, has been a fairly yeah. robust response rather than silence. Right, right. How you unwind that process that has been taken through ostensibly legal steps. Right, no, I, uh, so yes, I can see the mobilization. I guess what I'm reacting to um, are all the listservs I'm on of people saying, how do we teach this now? Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's law, but, <laughs> and, well, and so- that's the dilemma, right? It's not that there isn't a, a citizen's mobilization, mm -hmm. but as a lawyer, what do you do with those cases? And so that we don't get the uh, kind of response that you and I both mentioned about uh, when, when, uh, when we don't get the results we want from the system, we throw out the rules. Exactly. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't want that. Uh, there is a, a, an interesting question uh, that, that I put to all, all of you, uh, uh, whether you think that uh, the norms of the legal profession here or internationally um, uh, feed into um, this uh, uh, legal autocracy or blurring the line, as the questioner says, between civility and appeasement. Are there things that are cultural to the uh, legal profession that cause us not to stand up the way we should stand up? Well, I, maybe Juan can speak to that. I think he... <laughs> no, All right. My first reaction to that question, which I read in the, in the Q&A also, um, is, uh, is no, I think the, the codes of conduct of lawyers, uh, as far as I know them, uh, are clear and... Uh, uh, they are, uh, they, they, if, if they are properly understood and interpreted in, in good faith, which is a bit, the, the key question here, uh, they don't, they, they don't uh, um, end up in appeasement or in exaggerating, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems. Uh, I, uh, I, I think, however, that uh, this uh, rise of authoritarianism and the the uh, assistance to authoritarianism that Kim so eloquently described um, uh, applies also to the 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 the, the uh, uh, conduct of uh, politics internally in countries uh, that you know uh, are bringing so much disrepute to the legal profession because uh, you know the, the president of Peru was impeached, uh, I think, within a day or two of actually taking office uh, after being genuinely and democratically elected. Um, and that not only creates a state of uh, constant crisis, a political crisis in countries like Peru, and there are others, unfortunately, uh, but it's also an abuse of the law. It's, a, it's an abuse of the trickery and, and uh, bad faith application of principles, it has nothing to do 
with the standards of the legal profession. It is, well, it has something to do with it. It violates them. That's, that's the way I see it. Thank you. And, and I, I don't want to put her on the spot, but a, a question that I have to direct to President Coleman here, um, uh, uh, talking about uh, to, uh, how lawyers could really teach middle schoolers about uh, civics. And um, Susan has just launched a, a, a very large initiative on behalf of the Bar Association. Uh, and maybe you'd like to give us a couple of words about where, where that's going, Susan. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted to because uh, it's really an outgrowth of our rule of law task force. We have just launched a task force on civic education, on civic education for kids, but on civic education for adults. And I, on, you know, it is, it is literally just starting. The first meeting is happening this month, but um, I think part of the problem here is people are unaware of of what's happening because they are so, you know, kind of not clued in to the meaning of, of elections, of their right to vote, of how to change things, what does it mean for our judiciary, et cetera. And so we are delighted to start this task force and, and you can look at our, at the website for more information on the task force as it develops, but I couldn't agree more that civic education is something we really need to focus on so that we don't end up in a in a place that we've been before. Right, and that uh, city bar members should uh, look out for notices about how they can be involved in that. Absolutely. Because I think those are coming, it's those coming. are coming. It is coming. So, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and a link that will tell you about the launch of our civic education task force that Susan just described. So on that note, I want to say on behalf of the rule of law task force and our 14 co-sponsors, extremely grateful we are for the time of Kim Shepley, Juan Mendez, uh, Katerina Barkley, and Diane Orlinger. Uh, Orlinger. Uh, th these presentations have been uh, extraordinary, illuminating, and uh, frankly, chilling. Um, we, uh, we are grateful to uh, Diane for guiding our discussion so masterfully. And uh, we thank all of you in the audience for being with us this evening uh, too. Um, we are now on inescapable notice as lawyers that the future of our democracy is very much in our hands. Thank you and good night.